Hello there, online family. So good to see you. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here at Agora Bible Fellowship, and we just wanted to say welcome. Welcome to another online service. So our heart here at the church is that everyone is connected to a local body of believers. And so our hope is that these online messages are just supplemental, that they're either a great additional teaching in your week here on a midweek, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, just trying to dive into more of God's word, or you're gone traveling and you just don't want to miss a service. Either way, that is fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us here. A couple of things wanted to point your attention to. The first is we would love for you to text any prayer request that you have to 97,000. 97 and three zeros. Please text us those requests and we will pray for you this week. Stephanie will respond to you pretty much immediately uh, throughout the week. Uh, go ahead and test it. That would be great. We'd love to pray for you. A uh, couple other things. If you're interested in what is going on here at this local body of believers here in Agora, uh, Hills, California. We'd love for you to check out the website. You can see all the different ministries that we have, all the different events that are going on here in the next few weeks, ways to get plugged into groups, ways to serve. All that is on the website. As well, on the website is an opportunity to give. If you're interested in continuing to support the ministries here, uh, your donations, people donations, is the only way that we continue to have any sort of impact here and around the world. 10% of all money that comes in, then we distribute out to both local and global missions. Thank you so much for continuing to support the ministries here. We appreciate it a ton. So now, I don't want to keep you waiting. It is time to get into God's Word. That's why you're here, so let's do it. Well, greetings, extended church family. Thanks uh, again for being with us online, and I uh, want to invite you as we're going to continue working through 1 Corinthians, I want to invite you to start turning with me to chapter 11. We're in the second half of the uh, chapter uh, this week, continuing just kind of going verse by verse through this letter that's uh, oh so important. And as, as you're doing that, I, I'm wondering if anyone in our extended church family audience would describe themselves as easily distracted. Do you find yourself where there's just always something appealing for your attention and you're just torn from one thing to the next, you're drawn from one thing to another? And I would say out of any of the things, at least in my life, maybe you're like me uh, with this, that causes distraction is that crazy iPhone. I don't know if you have the same draw to that, that you just want to get so much done, but you keep going back to it. And the thing that probably causes me the most trouble on that crazy phone, maybe you recognize this from the bottom of your home screen, is the one that shows the unread text, the unread emails, and unread anything else on uh, different platforms. And I know uh, this, that image there isn't from my phone. I don't have 25,000 unread uh, emails, but we all have that. And my, unfortunately, the type A personality that I have likes to leave all of those things as zero. So there's nothing that's unread. There's nothing that hasn't been addressed. And so that can be a real distractor. Maybe your distractions are maybe more attached to the, the social media aspect of the phone, whether it's the, the, the Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, whichever one it is. We can all agree that there's plenty of distractions that we're surrounded with. And I'm not just referring to those distractions as I start talking about that here in this conversation. It's all of the competing things for our attention, our affection that the world has, that we're surrounded with, so many things that pull us away from really the big intention of our life is growing in intimacy with Jesus Christ and reaching a lost world with his love and grace. And so I believe as we're starting the conversation here about communion, that that is the exact reason why Jesus implemented a tool, a resource that would keep us coming back to Jesus. Keep us uh, from, from those who are wandering, those who are distracted, coming back, all the things that appeal for our attention and affection. He said, you know what? I'm going to put in place something that forces them to slow down, exhale, remember, commune, connect with the Messiah. 
That's what we're going to talk today about communion. And I'm really uh, encouraged by this section of, of, of scripture. At first read, I was like not sure where it was going. But then when you start looking at it through the lens of current distractions and the coming back to Jesus, you get a little bit of a sense why Paul was so serious about it, why it was such an intense topic. So I'm going to just pray uh, before we dive into this section uh, but I'm excited to see how it has a word, I believe, for each one of us. Lord Jesus, thanks uh, for this opportunity to gather and a chance to uh, just focus on you just through this conversation about communion and with our known tendency to wander, to be distracted. We need you. We need your spirit to help us to hone in and focus on what you want to say to us through this section. God, we invite that. We're excited to be in your word. We're excited to have a, a medium, a platform like this where we can connect uh, even through the, the airwaves with the opportunity to study your word. We invite that now in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right, so starting 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we're going to look at verse 17 through the end of the chapter today, starting in verse 17. This is what it says. But in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you and I believe it in part for there must be fractions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. All right, so stop there. Where are we coming from? You might remember in last week's section of Scripture, first he took time before getting into the tougher topics to commend them, to encourage them for following his example, to be uh, remembering the things that he had taught them. Here he's saying <clears throat> the following instructions, I do not commend you. In other words, I'm not proud of your actions. There's no sugarcoating this. He's going straight into confronting things. And what does he have an issue with? You see right there in the text, he has an issue with the division that's kind of snuck into the church. It's something that has become such an issue that he's even saying, notice what he's saying, that it would be better maybe that they not even gather. Man, if something has gotten to that place with Paul's passion and heart for the church and, and desire for them to commune together, you're like, man, things have must have escalated pretty intense in order for it to get to that point. And really, we don't know what the reasons for the division or what the conflicts were. The word actually used there, the Greek words, word is schismata, which means differences in opinion. And this isn't talking about a difference in theological opinion. It's not talking about understanding God's plan. It's actually all of the peripheral stuff that there's difference in opinion, all the ideological, all the cultural debate, all the things that we're surrounded with and so easily can distract us. Think about all of those things that we've had on the table for the last couple of years, whether it's stuff with health, whether it's stuff with politics, whether it's stuff with vaccines, whether it's stuff with masks. There's so many things appealing for areas of debate within the church and he's saying, he's pushing against that. He's like, man, it'd be better for us maybe not even to, to meet, for us to gather. First thing he wants them to get figured out is this division and divisiveness within the church. You might remember earlier in our book study in chapters one through three, they were having issues where they were being divided over who was following who. Some were following Paul, some were following Peter. And he's saying, man, don't be divided about that. Now he's bringing up another thing. Don't be the debatable people that are stuck in silly conversations that really have no eternal value or significance. Why is that? Why do people have that? Why do they head that direction? I would say the number one reason that we get into silly debate is because we're operating in the flesh and not in the spirit. When we're operating in the flesh, there's this need to be right. There's this need to be uh, intellectually above somebody, to win an argument. When we're operating in the flesh, we're elevating the person 
over our, our when we're operating the spirit, we, we're elevating the person over ourselves. See, he's calling them out because as it goes into the topic about communi uh, communion and participating in the, in the Lord's Supper, he's like, man, you can't have communion when there's div that, that's intended to be a, a uniting thing. You can't have that and participate in that when there's division among you. It's interesting that he says, he says, I hear this and I believe it in part. What do you think? Why do you think he says that? Believe it in part. I mean, what, the only thing that explanation in my reading this week that made sense is really whenever he's hearing stories and accounts of what's going on, he's sure that he's not getting the full story. Any of us that are parents understand that you usually get partial explanation, but not exactly all of the details. So he's leaving some room for some variance in what's being presented to him, but he's still convinced that I believe it in part, that these issues, that this division is a real problem among you. And you think about that, he explains it in verse 19. He says, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. What does he mean by that? Why does there need to be factions? Why does there need to be division? It's interesting because God has a tendency to use things from our fallen sinful world to sharpen us, to expose the, I, I, I like to call this the, the, tooth the toothpaste effect. Think about a, having a bottle of toothpaste. What happens when you squeeze it? The contents come out. What's actually real, what's on the inside actually works its way to the surface. The same is true with the church. When it deals with conflict, when there's the squeeze that happens within the church, you actually begin to see who's genuine, who's not, who's walking in the spirit, who's walking in the flesh, who's, who's leaning into their own knowledge and who's calling out to God for rescue. I'll tell you what, when I look at the history even of this church itself. They've been through some difficult seasons, and I believe some of those difficult seasons actually help to, to shape and, and, and form the godly men and women that we currently have a part of our church now, not to say that we're without fault or without issue. But I think what he's realizing and what Paul realizes, what we realize today, is that some of the issues in conflict are a necessary part of God's shaping process within the church. But basically, the issue that he's confronting is that person, and we all have to ask and wrestle through that truth. Is that person me? The person that just leaves kind of a, a wake of conflict. The person that has unresolved stuff, unresolved issues that could be resolved things that could be worked through, but the person that leans towards debate and argument, he's saying, man, we cannot have that within the church. I would stay, say that's still a critical thing for protecting the unity within the church. It's something he starts out of the gate to address. And it's things like that where silly debate is one of the distractions that we need to be brought back to Jesus, brought back to Jesus, laying down the sword and coming back to him. Continue. So the next thing he confronts. So first issue is the silly debates that had kind of set, taken root in the church. The second thing, see if you catch it in the text. It says, when you come together, it is not the Lord's supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? exclamation mark. Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Wow, this is probably one of the saltiest we've seen Paul in a long time. This, he's getting pretty intense. What's the, the issue that he's bringing out? He's condemning their abuse of the Lord's Supper. Two things in Scripture that we're co commanded to do as part of the ordinances or part of our gathering of believers. The first one is for those who have made a decision to embrace Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. The first thing is they're commanded, they're directed 
to be baptized. That's a, a response that's seen throughout the New Testament. It's clear as day. The second thing that Jesus put in place, that he instituted and literally directed us, commanded us to partake in, was this area of communion. So there's lots of things in life that you can kind of wrestle through. Oh, I'm not sure what the Lord's will is, what his direction. Not in those areas. Those are, are crystal clear that he's called us to that. So what was happening in their situation that Paul's actually confronting? See, they had a tradition of gathering together as the church family and enjoying a meal together. The Baptists did not invent the potluck. This, was, this is something all the way from the early church. And the way it worked there in an impoverished environment is those who had a lot would add to and bring to the, the potluck. And those who didn't would really actually more so depend on the potluck meals, even for their sustenance. So that's what's happening is they'd have these meals. And at the end of those gatherings, they would take time to commemorate what Jesus had done for them through the act or faithful obedience, uh, the act of communion. Well, what they were doing in Corinth is they're starting to treat those gatherings, those potlucks, if you will, as an excuse to just full out indulge, to, to feast. And, and, and as we see even described there, that they kind of followed suit with their kind of background of pagan idol feasts where they would get drunk during the meal. They would all be gluttonous during the meal. They would just indulge in everything that was offered and really giving no concern. We see it there no concern for those who are poor. If you're, you're poor, you're showing up late for the meal, you are too late, you're out of luck because it's all been consumed in this, in this selfish, gluttonous, drunken feast. So you can see why this is getting Paul pretty fired up. He's like, man, this has wandered so far from God's intent from God's design. You see, he's pointing out to them. He's just like, man, if, if you just want to stuff your face, stay home, eat food at home. He's like, do you not have food at home? Stay at home if that's what you're concerned about. This is intended to be a time where we re remember Christ and we share. It's interesting what he says in verse 22. He says, what, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? And look what he says. He says, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate the, those who have nothing? See, this is an important principle for us to understand within the body of Christ, that our actions actually make a statement about what we believe and where our heart is at. You see, their actions were saying, and whether they realize it or not, their actions were saying, hey, I'm not too concerned about the poor. Their actions were saying, oh, I despise the church and what was put in place. He's questioning them. You know, they're, they're like, he's like, you realize that the things, the behavior that you're participating in are speaking volumes about where your heart is at. So how does it, how does it apply today? How does this even relate to us today? Truth be told, similar to then, it's easy to head towards a self-indulgent, selfish existence, where really you're just feasting on all the things, all the luxuries that you can, that you can afford, with really no consideration for others. It's a demonstration of coming so far from God's intent for our resources. Really, that picture of indulgence, of selfish indulgence, is really the picture so often of where wealth takes us. If we're not careful, it can be a distraction and take us away from the one thing that satisfies, and that is Jesus Christ himself. So communion is, again, the antidote for division. It's also the antidote for this selfish lifestyle, the invitation to say, come back. Okay, you've gotten distracted. You've gotten self-consumed. Come back to Jesus. Come back to Jesus. That is God's intent for communion we're going to look at in a moment. I wanted to just jot down and add a couple things to our list 
of potential distractions. So we've already uh, looked at the whole potential for, for debate and uh, argumentative spirit. Then we see indulgence as a distraction. I'd say a couple more present day that distract us, that can take us off base for those that want to be honest with themselves and admit they've been wandering, if you will. Another one that I would say that really can get our attention is just anxiety about the unknown. Anxiety about the things of life that are just like, oh, this is, this is my concern about this. I'm, I'm fearful of this. I'm fearful of that. that what, do, what does tomorrow hold? What about uh, the world that we're in? What about my health? And th those things can be such a distraction. As we've seen in the nu past number of years, they can really take us off base. And so the invitation of communion is again, saying, blowing the horn, saying, come back to Jesus. Another source or other area with potential to distract. I jotted it down as the rat race. What do I mean by the rat race? The rat race of what we all get stuck in if we're not careful. Wake up. Eat breakfast, go to work, eat lunch, work a little bit more, eat dinner, watch some TV, go to sleep, rinse, repeat the exact same thing with really, we get stuck in that rut with little to no thought about Jesus, about fostering that relationship, little to no thought about, hey, what does it look like for me to advance the kingdom, to have an impact on lives, to, to draw and point people to the rescuing work that Jesus can do in their life? The rat race, I think, is one of the biggest distractions we have to be so cautious of. Last one, and I'm sure you could add to this list, this is one that maybe hits home, no pun intended, a little bit too close. This idea of the perfect family experience. A lot of us can be distracted with something that's good, that God gave us, the gift of family. But it can be consuming if we're not careful. It can be distracting if we're not careful. Okay, off to the, the kids' sports thing. Okay, let's make sure they have this experience. Let's make sure we go on this trip. Let's make sure we go to Disney again. Make sure they'd get this. And, and all of the things that revolve around family that is a gift from God, if we're not careful, we can idolize and they can be something that distract us for what God's calling is on our life. Intimacy with him, glorifying him, pointing to him, to the world around us, family itself, which is a good thing, can also be a distraction. So debate, needless debate, indulgences, anxiety, the rat race, the perfect family experience. Look at what he invites them to, to recenter on Jesus. Verse 23, it says, For I receive from the Lord... What I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, I'm guessing if you've been in uh, church world for a while, that, while that's a, a description that you've heard, that that's commonplace. Often when we're going through a time of communion, that's a section of scripture uh, that is read, that is pointed to. But it's interesting, often you don't consider that it's right after a significant level of rebuke, or I should say right in the middle of a significant level of rebuke. What he's doing is he's inviting them. He's bringing his audience back to being centered on Jesus Christ. Most theologians agree that 1 Corinthians, the letter was actually available to the church before even the gospel letters, the, the accounts of Jesus's life. So for many of his audience, this would have been the very first clear explanation of what actually took place at the Last Supper. 
And he, we see that it was something that was received directly from the Lord. This is divine inspiration that God outlined this for Paul in order for him to explain what took place on that Passover meal before his sacrifice. If you're familiar with Jewish, have some Jewish background or understanding, the Passover is something that's used as a tool to commemorate and to remember God's rescue of the Israelites from Egypt. If you remember the, pl- the story of the plagues and the really it all built up towards the taking of the firstborn son. And the way that the Israelites were rescued, if you remember, was taking the blood of a lamb and putting it on the doorposts of their house. It was, a, a, it was a foreshadowing of what was to come with Jesus. In order for them to avoid death, they needed a sacri- the sacrifice of a perfect lamb. Well, you see, Jesus in that last supper was actually converting something. He was taking something that foreshadowed and actually making it new. The old covenant that was dependent on animal sacrifice. He's saying, I'm making a new covenant with you. This new covenant is dependent on me and my sacrifice. Jesus explains that this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, no longer in remembrance of what took place back in that time. This is a remembrance of me. And he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You see, there's a a change there. Now it wasn't the lamb from the Old Testament that they're pointing to. Now it's the spotless lamb that was given on a cruel Roman cross. You see, the the rescue that happened in Egypt paled in comparison to the rescue offered on Calvary, the forgiveness of all your sin from the past, the present, and the future, the rescue that comes only through the blood of Jesus Christ. And here's the important thing to understand in that new covenant is the only part that we play in that new covenant, our single part is belief. Belief is what it hinges on, on our side. If we place our trust and hope in him, that's how we participate. So the the old covenant is being replaced by the new, and it's a communion that's now saying, man, I believe. I'm committed to that. I, I trust in you. So the communion is the slowing down, the taking time to reflect on what took place on that, at that last supper. It's us pro- making or reinstating the, uh, refreshing the vow or the pledge that was made through belief. And he tells us, it's real clear, do this in remembrance of me. Do this, do you see the instruction part of it? So if we actually do it, we're being obedient. If we, we're, we're being obedient. If we don't do it, what would that be considered? That's disobedience. So there's, there's not an option to be like, you know, I don't really do the communion thing. I don't really participate in that. He's, no, this is a, a clear and direct instruction for us. It's how we commemorate his death. When Jesus instructed, he says, as often as you drink it. Now that leaves us with a little bit of question of how frequent we're intended to do it. It seems to me that that leaves a little bit of freedom. We read in the book of Acts, it says, uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 7 refers to, it says, the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. First day of the week would be Sunday, and so they would participate in communion then. And so today, present day, as a church, we participate in communion once a month to take time to commemorate, to remember the sacrifice that was made. And it's interesting that it says, that that was something as a means to proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. See, every time we actually slow down, we are free of distraction. We come back to Jesus. We come back to him recognizing, man, I'm so dependent on you. I'm so thankful for you. All of the things when we collide with him, all the things that happen, God, I am sorry for falling short of your perfect standard. God, thank you so much for the forgiveness that's offered through Jesus Christ. You see, when we come back to him, 
It actually, we see there, proclaims the Lord's death until he comes. The, until he comes is a reminder that he is coming back. In case you didn't know that, if you're not aware of that, that is a date on the ca calendar in the, I would suggest, near future. Clearly proclaiming you can't sneak past the gospel when you work through communion. He explains what's intended about as part of communion. Verse 27, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. All right, so what do we see there? It's a little bit of an outline of what's intended with communion. So we know that communion brings us back to Jesus. What, so what does that look like? For what we know it doesn't look like, he's, or it shouldn't look like, is to approach it in an unworthy manner. Those are the words that are used there. Basically the idea of not taking it seriously, being flippant about it, being careless about it, being indifferent towards communion. Or maybe another part of approaching it with a, in an unworthy manner would be the person that sees it strictly as just ceremonial. This is a function. There's just no, nothing personal about it. It's, a, it's just a, an act with really symbolic without personal meaning to it. Another way I would suggest we see in Scripture as partaking in an unworthy manner would be the person that's taking or partaking in it that's never embraced Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That would for sure be an unworthy manner. You can't be reminded, you can't remember his sacrifice if you've never embraced his sacrifice. So that's what he cautions his audience against. He's saying, and you don't want to be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. It's kind of this idea of guilty of dishonoring Jesus Christ. How we treat the table of communion is how we're treating Jesus himself. Man, that's, it's pretty intense, but here's the thing I want to say to you. I didn't write this. We're all reading this together. This is what scripture points to. That's why the word here that we're called to, we're called to examination, to take time to examine, to check ourselves. The, the Greek word there means rigorous examination, to take a moment to, to, to slow down and really check ourselves across the board. Talking to God, seeing, asking him to expose any unconfessed sin in our life. Looking at your heart, is there anything that's going on there that shouldn't be happening? Checking your actions, your motives, your, your attitudes. Examining if there's any unresolved conflict. Find it interesting in Matthew 5, 23 and 24, Jesus directed thus before giving an offering in the church, to go to actually leave the offering there and go and resolve any resolved, unresolved issues with a fellow brother before participating, even in giving your offering. So you gotta assume that that would be the same with communion. You can't go into it half-heartedly. You can't go into it with unresolved stuff. He's saying, take this seriously. And he describes it describes that at the end of that warning or that caution, it says, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. Now, you might say, you're like, Pastor Scott, well, what does, what does that mean, drinking judgment upon yourself? What does that look like? I thought as a Christ follower, there's no condemnation. There's, no, there's nothing that separates us from the love of, the, of Christ. Yes, all that is absolutely true. But the word judgment there is translated to the word krima, which actually in the Greek means chastisement. So it's chastisement slash discipline, not damnation. So what it's saying is our mishandling of communion can provoke discipline in our life. It can be something that stirs and moves God towards, all right, man, I, I guess I need to discipline him the, or him or her in order to get their attention. So it's something we're about to see that we should take very seriously. Continue with the last couple of verses here in verse 30. That is why many of you are weak and ill 
and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. The, that whole idea of, of checking yourself. Verse 32, but when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined. Important to hear that word there. So that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. He's given some guidelines. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home. So that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give direction when I come. Remember a, a number of years back, we started seeing uh, this kind of trend for people wearing these t-shirts. Here's a picture of them if you haven't seen it before. It says, Jesus is my homeboy. I remember seeing that at first, I kind of chuckled at it, but the more I thought about it, I'm like, you know what, that doesn't really settle well with me. Because I don't really feel like that gives an appropriate level of reverence and respect to who Jesus is. Jesus is the judge over all of mankind. And he's the judge and the discerner and decider of what chastisement even the believer experiences. So for us, even though we, wanna, we understand we have a relational God and a God that intends to be, have intimacy with us, it's not someone that is our homeboy as described in that t-shirt. It's not someone to be taken lightly. It's not like one of our buddies that we chuckle with. It's not, that, that's not it at all. He's our Lord and Savior and should be treated as such. He describes here that God takes what happens in communion and worship so seriously. What happens when we gather for worship on a Sunday morning? To me, I, it's fascinating because one, it's a reminder that he notices what happens. It's not as if he's indifferent towards it or, or, or it's no big deal. What actually happens when, he, when we gather, he's paying attention to that. He notices and even responds to it with consequence if we don't respond to it appropriately. It's kind of a, a fascinating to even consider the consequences that are outlined here for not taking communion seriously. It says the, well, the, those who are weak or, or ill or, or even those who have died, it's crazy to think that healthy issues may even be attached to our choices around communion. That somebody might be like, man, I, I've been sick. I can't get over this. And you're like, well, maybe something to consider is how, what's your response look like to communion? Obviously, that's not something that we typically think of or point somebody to when they have some sort of an ailment. But when we understand how serious God takes his worship, man, if you don't, take, if you don't believe that, spend any amount of time in the Old Testament looking at the tabernacle and what was involved in worship in the Old Testament, and you're like, man, he really, it's as serious as a heart attack. And so a little glimpse of New Testament is he still takes his worship serious and he definitely takes communion serious. Why? Why, did, why is he so serious about it? Why, why is it? why is he uh, saying, he says, because I don't want you to be condemned or judged along with the rest of the world. I would rather have you experience a little bit of discipline now it's kind of like the, the kid that you don't mind that they feel a little bit of the heat of the stove in order to protect them from getting a bad burn later on. You're like, man, I'm actually okay with them feeling the heat of that, the, the temperature, because you're just like, man, I'm concerned of what's at stake here, if not. So Paul, in his megaphone for the Corinthian church, is bringing them back to God's heart and design for communion. It's a megaphone that's saying, come back to Jesus. And if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of us have been in a season of wandering for too long. We've been distracted by the, the things of this world. We've been distracted by entertainment or a pursuit of stuff or, or chasing after things, divisions, arguments, the fear, all of the things as I've discussed get our attention. But here's the wonderful thing about communion is it's always an invitation to come back to him. 
to a place of dependence, a place of acknowledgement. Man, God, I cannot do anything apart from you. I cannot experience this life. I don't want to take another step forward. So when we're together on Sunday this weekend, we're going to have a chance to actually implement what we've been talking about. We're going to have a special time of communion. But for those of you online, my invitation for you is to actually, rather than this, just add up to a pile of things that you've heard and listened to, what if you actually took time, whether it's with your family, whether it's individually, to slow down, maybe it's a little juice, maybe it's a little bread, and take time, maybe even for the first time, to have communion in a manner that would be honoring to God. A manner that involves reflection, that revolves asking some tough questions about unconfessed sin, and ask some tough questions about uh, our attitude, and ask some tough uh, questions about maybe uh, our, our wandering, our, our distraction. And what if you actually took some time and had communion? Man, that would be, I promise, a memorable experience if you apply that to your life, even in response to this today. Otherwise, let me just close our time in a word of prayer uh, before we finish up. Lord Jesus, thank you so much uh, for your word on this. And when we really get back to what the intent of communion is, it's the invitation to come back. I pray that we would see it as such, that we wouldn't get distracted from all the different things that appeal for our attention, but we would use communion as a tool to keep on coming back to you. And I thank you, Jesus, that you have that as an open invitation. It's not a, 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 a club of anger that's saying, oh, you've left, you've wandered, but it's the humility that keeps saying, oh man, I'm here with open arms, keep coming back to me the invitation I pray that we'd partake in. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.